Okay, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and uh, this is uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge. And we're talking today with uh, Nicole Lowen. Uh, she's state representative, and she chairs the Energy and Environmental Committee. And she joins us by remote from her office in the state capitol uh, here in downtown Honolulu. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Uh, thank you. So we wanted to discuss today with you the, the issues before your committee in this uh, 2020 legislative session. Uh, and that includes, of course, uh, energy and it includes environment, both really critically important. I hope everyone in the legislature agrees that both of those subjects are critically important, yeah? Yes, I would hope so as well. <laughs> okay, so can you tell me who's on your committee? Um, and then we'll go into the substantive bills that have been uh, introduced into the hopper. Sure. Um... My committee includes myself as chair, Representative uh, Tina Wildberger as vice chair. She's from Maui. We have a couple other members from the Big Island, Representative Chris Todd and David Tarnas. And then we have Rep uh, Ryan Yamane, Karen Har, and Cynthia Thielen from Oahu. What, how is it, what is it like to be the chair of this committee? I mean, it's a, you know, these are important issues, as we said. Um, and, you know, it's a great weight on your shoulders. How do you feel about that? Uh, how how much weight is there, and, and how do you deal with it? Um, I mean, I, I I enjoy being the chair. These are issues that I'm passionate about and that I've worked on for many years. And, um, you know, being the chair, I feel like it really gives you the opportunity to, um, you know, work in more depth on, on these issues and, and be able to, um, you know, have a little more control over decision making and what moves forward, et cetera. So I'm I'm enjoying it, and it can be um, it's a lot more work than just being a member of a committee, but um, it's very rewarding as well. Yeah, you're you're the shepherd, guiding the flock, so to speak. And you spoke at the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum uh, legislative briefing uh, in January, uh, and that was very good. I enjoyed your talk, and in fact, we made a movie of it, and it's. Right now, it's on YouTube and it's on the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum uh, website. I don't know if you've seen it, but you look pretty good in I that. I did not. I'll have to, I'll have to go look for that. <laughs> yeah, please do. And thank you for doing that. Uh, in any event, um, let's talk about the issues because they're all important. Uh, and of course, we know that some of them will pass and others will not. Uh, and you have a fair amount to say about that by uh, having a hearing or not um, and about moving it ahead or not. So let's talk about energy first. What, what are your favorite bills? What should we discuss? Uh, what is in the hopper on energy? Um, there is a lot in the hopper on energy. Um, I would say that at this point in time, kind of the overarching theme of, of, of the bills that we consider relating to energy and other environmental issues, it's, it, a lot of it has to do with the climate change. And you know, if we're talking about energy, it's usually uh, about renewable energy and how we're going to move forward faster and how we're going to um, use less fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, one of the bills we have this year is to um, fix the calculation of Hawaii's renewable portfolio standards to ensure that um, we are, you know, meaning 100% when we say 100% so that it would calculate um, that percentage based on generation rather than sales, and then kind of in conjunction with that, there's another bill that looks at establishing a renewable portfolio um, standard for the gas utilities so that they're being treated similarly to the um, energy utility, electric utility. You know, that and, leads me um, to ask you about, um, you know, the line between the PUC and the legislature. You know, there's a line there somewhere, and the legislature does some things uh, in policy, and and of course, the PUC uh, is a regulator, but it also defines policy, maybe on a you know a, a, a smaller scale. But where would you say the line is? What what's reserved for the legislature? What's reserved for the PUC? I mean, I think at the end of the day, the the policymakers are the legislature, and the PUC is a policymaker insofar as we empower them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes. You know, when a, when a bill is, uh, you know, when there's two sides to an issue and there's supporters and opponents of a bill, like I'm thinking, for example, when we passed um, several years ago the Community-Based Renewable Energy Bill, the original bills that were introduced were very specific and prescriptive, but 
Um, in order to get that passed, the compromise position, I think, was to make it more general and just request the, P the PUC open a docket and have them be the policymakers because I feel like the stakeholders feel like that process gives them, you know, more time and more play as, you know, being part of that decision. And mm -hmm. it is true that compared to the legislative timelines on some of these things that, that um, for certain issues, the PUC is more um, able to give things more uh, careful consideration, and they do have a lot of expertise as well. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, um, you know, sometimes the legislature needs to be the leader on, you know, pushing forward new things. So there's, I think that's where the boundary falls. Yeah, and I you remember, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, when uh, performance-based regulation was uh, the, 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 the word of the day, and uh, let's see what happened. Uh, both the legislature and the PUC both adopted in their case, a, a docket, and in your case, a statute, calling for an inquiry into, you know, performance-based uh, regulation. I mean, calling for a change to performance-based regulation. And right. I well, I think the bill that was passed at the legislature required the PUC to open a docket, and so that was the impetus for doing it. Okay. So it was, I think, one and then the other, not concurrent. Well, do you, do you, I guess you talk to them. Did they come and testify? Do you pick up the phone and say hi? Uh, you know, what is what is the connection? How do you compare notes with the, your your regulator, who really works for the legislature in so many ways? Yeah, they're. I mean, they're available to discuss policy with us, the same as other stakeholders. So yeah, I mean, I can call and ask questions or set up meetings, just as I can with other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. And that gives you the depth of all that expertise out there, and there's plenty of it. And as you say, it does require a certain amount of expertise. Well, let's go on look yeah, to sure. other... But, you know, after my eighth year on the committee and second year as chair, I feel like I've, you know, gotten, gained a fair amount of expertise myself as well. So it's not like we're just driving blind. Yes, of course. Um, and it, it shows. So uh, what other bills have you got uh, in the hopper on energy and and um, let me add a footnote to say that energy and environment are in, intrinsically related because of the whole notion that energy affects climate change and environment. So one, mm -hmm. you know, it's a perfect joinder to have them both in one committee. But what else uh, is right. specifically energy? Um, I, I think two of the big topics of conversation, similar to last session that we're still pushing on this session, are. Um, uh, energy efficiency, number one, and number two, electric vehicles. And although that's not as directly related to um, the energy side of the discussion, I guess, as um, the energy efficiency piece, it's certainly interrelated. So mm -hmm. um, a couple bills that we have that I'm excited about um, involve mandates that just apply to the state. And so it's pushing the state to move forward with transitioning its fleets to electric vehicles and uh, requiring that for state facilities like state um, office buildings, which include hospitals, schools, et cetera, that um, they undertake energy efficiency measures. Um, and I think that um, you know it's important to elevate this conversation about energy efficiency because that's a huge you know, piece of how we're going to get 200%. We have to continue to try to manage the demand side of things. Um, and can't just offset all our energy use with production. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, let's talk about uh, electric vehicles. And my recollection is that there are, there are a million cars in the state and 10,000 of them are electric vehicles. We have certain incentives, but um, it, it's, you know, it's, um, it, this, this whole idea has been in play for, oh gosh, it must be 10 years. Um, and query, are we moving fast enough for you? And what is this bill? do to make it faster? Well, there are several other measures as well. So there's also a bill that would establish an income tax credit, um, like a really direct incentive, financial incentive for the purchase of an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a, you know, there's a bill I discussed that, you know, requires the transition of state fleets by 2045 and establishes kind of a soft goal uh, statewide for 100% renewable transportation by 2045. Uh, those are actually both just for light-duty vehicles um, and then for medium and heavy-duty vehicles, like where it's feasible, because uh, the replacements for those uh, at a cost-effective level don't currently, aren't currently necessarily readily available. Um, and then um, 
you know, last year we passed the bill that would provide a rebate for the installation of EV charging stations. So we have a bill, again, in this year that would just appropriate additional funds to that because that was a relatively small amount we put in last year. I think that once everything gets rolling, we'll probably go through it pretty quickly. Um, there is a bill that um, allows state agencies to use the GEM financing to um, uh, move forward on fleet transition and um, EV infrastructure, and that would be at no cost, additional cost to the state, so that's a really good measure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and I think there's other things potentially coming over from the Senate that I haven't had a chance to review yet, so. Uh, but like I said, it just remains a large and important topic of discussion. I think that we've done a lot regarding our electricity generation and renewable energy and, you know, reducing our use of fossil fuels, but now the transportation sector remains the biggest user, and, you know, ground transportation is the easiest place to start. Oh, sure. Well, it, and of course, there's, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it's $6 billion goes out of the state for oil. Um, right. So uh, we'd rather keep it here somehow. Uh, so ele electric cars uh, are only renewable if the, uh, the, the source of the, uh, the power is from a renewable source. Uh, and even if uh, some people say, well, it's not really a renewable source, we're still using uh, fossil fuel for the source. Fact is that uh, electric cars become more renewable as the utility becomes more renewable, and that's happening. Uh, so it's, it's certainly worthwhile doing that. But, you know, I, I just uh, worry about uh, the incentivization. I remember, you know, a few years ago, you had a federal incentive, a tax credit, and you had a state tax credit. Uh, right now, we don't have... We don't have a state tax credit, as I understand it. So the question is, which one of those bills that you, you mentioned uh, is going to do a better job at, uh, you know, the, the, the lesser cost to the, the taxpayers? Um, and which one of them is likely to succeed, or could they all succeed? Um, it, that's a good question. I can't. I don't have a crystal ball, so I think we'll have to see where the conversation goes. I think the things that cost money are always a bigger, you know, a bigger hike uphill because uh, there's so much competition over over general funds. So, you know, that's that's a factor. No, one of um, one of the things I would just say too that uh, about renewable about electric vehicles being only as renewable as the grid is. Um, it's true to a degree, but also for a lot of the early adopters, because it, it's what makes the most financial sense. If you're someone who already has TV on your rooftop, then it makes a lot of sense um, to have an electric vehicle that can take advantage of that. And so I think that on that level, I mean, I guess that could vary. If you had net metering, then you might not be incentivizing using that at the right time of day. But for a lot of the programs, I think that... Um, that it is utilizing renewable energy. And then as we move forward with EV infrastructure, I think that establishing time of use rates and looking at how to incentivize the charging during daylight hours, et cetera, yeah. is going to be an important piece. But I think that's that very much on everybody's everybody's radar. So Yeah, for sure. Um, and as I understand it, it's still a more efficient use than, like, petroleum. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Fuel. So even even if it's coming from, even if it's charging a battery on the, you know, off a grid that's not very renewable, it's still more efficient use of that imported oil mm -hmm. than turning it into uh, gasoline. But so where where uh, does uh, hydrogen fit in all of this, Nicole? I mean, <clears throat> we talked about hydrogen a long time. Uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion about hydrogen at uh, at uh, PGV on the Big Island. Uh, there was, um, you know, discussion about uh, shipping hydrogen in, in, in uh, these big uh, containers. It's not that big, but, you know, these tanks around, around the state and using it to, to create energy, uh, you know, wherever it was shipped to um, as a way, to, a way to have essentially renewable fuel uh, made available for uh, both generation and also for cars. But I, I'm not clear on whether there's a a tax credit, or for that matter, a tax credit under these bills you've been talking about for hydrogen cars, which are, at the end of the day, they're also electric because they use the fuel cell um, right. and, and so forth. So where, where is that and is that being incentivized? Is there public attention on that issue? Um, I mean, I think if we did a tax credit that applied to electric vehicles because we did make 
at least for some of the definitions of electric vehicles that are in statute that we passed it last year, so I think it does include, would include hydrogen vehicles. Um, the current bill that we're considering that's moved, that's been moving forward does um, limit the total, like it, it would apply to vehicles up to, I think, $50,000 in value, so we're not going to give a tax credit to someone to buy a $100,000 vehicle. Um, but yeah, for hydrogen, I mean, I think hydrogen is a great option. We could should continue to figure out ways to incentivize it, but the reality is that it's just not at a point where it's cost effective. And similar for at least compared to electric vehicles, um, the, you know that as electric vehicles as as they're not not meaning hydrogen vehicles. It's just the the cost of that is so much lower in the current market. And then hydrogen, similar to um, the grid, is only as renewable as the energy that you use to create it. So. Um, as, as far as there's excess energy available for things like geothermal or if there's curtailed energy that we could use to create hydrogen or if there's ways to capture um, gas from a landfill facility or something like that and then use that to make hydrogen, which they're discussing on Big Island, I think that makes a lot of sense and I'm really, really supportive of it. But mm -hmm. the idea that there's like a parity when you compare EVs, you know, in the current point in time when you compare um, EV is like a leaf or a Tesla or whatever to a hydrogen vehicle and how feasible it is to for, you know, the mass public to adopt them on mass scale. It's just not at that point yet, and it would be a lot more expensive to make that hydrogen so than is, to um, uh, charge it. Are you, are you doing incentives? Are there incentives for, I think I heard that you mentioned something along these lines, uh, for, for uh, charging stations. For example, if I want to go out, if I have a little lot, and it's on a main thoroughfare. Maybe it's even a, a gas station in the conventional sense. And I want to include, um, you know, hydrogen or a charging station or whatever, you know, alternative fuels. Is there is there a statutory incentive for me to do that? Uh, I think you mentioned that there might be something in the hopper on that. What, what would it be? Yeah, so we actually passed a bill last year for a rebate for EV charging stations, which does not include a hydrogen fueling station. But... That um, got passed and, you know, went to, we, PUC basically was in charge of that and contracted it through Hawaii Energy because they were already um, managing a smaller rebate program that had been funded by Ulupono. And so, like, Hawaii Energy's done several press releases in the past couple months, so that program is actually up and running, the, the rebate program that state funded. And um, there are rebates available for upgrade or installation of new um, EV charging stations. And that applies to basically publicly accessible areas. So we're not letting, we're not giving a rebate to somebody who wants to put a charging station, you know, in their garage. It's for workplaces and multi-unit dwellings. And um, I think potentially also for um, fleets, if there's a business that wants to invest in doing this too. Our fleet vehicles. Well, it strikes me that the um, probably the most efficient way to distribute uh, charging, you know, electricity for charging electric vehicles is is in a sort of a you know um, a, a st lots of stations instead of lots of individual homeowners and condo units uh, where you you're making one charging station for a very few people. You'd rather distribute it where you have one charging station for many people. And so, I mean, assuming uh, that that's the case, assuming that would be good policy, then the idea would be to incentivize charging stations that serve many people all over town. I don't know if we've yeah. reached that yet, but- and that's what we that's what we passed last year and what we're looking at adding additional funds to this year. Yeah, good, good, okay. Yeah. So, well, so one other point about um, and, and you know I think there is a need to kind of take a more step back and take a holistic look at what is our approach to the EV infrastructure yeah um, question because it's been very kind of patchwork to date um, but as things start picking up and the momentum starts rolling on this transition then I think um, that we do need to have a bigger conversation about what is the state or regulatory role in just kind of ensuring that the infrastructure is in place and is functioning. But it's going to be different. You know, it'll be different than gas stations because, you know, one, we want to figure out a way that we're going to incentivize people to charge during daylight and peak, peak hours of renewable production. Um, and that's probably going to be a lot at workplaces. Um, 
in commercial areas, and so, you know, it's a little bit different. And the difference, too, is that, you know, gas stations um, are regulated in a, in a different kind of way because they have this substance that's an environmental hazard. You have to build, build big underground tanks and, mm -hmm. yep. um, and all of that. And the EV infrastructure is going to be, it's, for the time being at least, it's less regulated in a certain way. So there's a lot of questions that surround it um, that have to be looked at. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that uh, maybe it's only aspirational, but uh, the goal would be to go completely uh, non-fossil fuel vehicles by, what, 2045. Uh, I think you, you called it a soft target. What, what does that mean, a soft target, and uh, um, well, how I far can we go? A lot of, there's a lot of fear in the industry and pushback if, if we um, try to make it something that has teeth or that could somehow be enforced. So I think the way that the bill is written and that bill number is House Bill 2699, um, you know, establishes a 100% uh, clean ground transportation goal for light-duty vehicles statewide, so that includes public and private vehicles, but then I think the, the language and the purpose clause of the bill notes that um, there's an understanding that there's still questions about how this will be attainable, and, um, and uh, we're just trying to, I guess, allay fears that this is going to be draconian in some way. But then I think it's important. You have to start somewhere. And I think establishing these goals is important. And we've seen that in the past with what started as the, you know, Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative and eventually became 100%, mm -hmm. um, you know, renewable. So One more, one more uh, energy yeah. bill, and then we've got to go to environment. But, I mean, I know there are other things, but one more that strikes my interest is uh, the one about uh, uh, giving a – tax credit uh, for batteries which are built into an existing system rather than batteries that are wrapped into, you know, the creation of a brand new system, uh, say, in a family residence. Uh, and that bill has been, my recollection is, it's, it's been kicking around the legislature for a few years, but it has not passed. Uh, is it there again? Uh, will it pass? Uh, what are the considerations? And w what, is, uh, what is the appetite for it? I think that the tax credit generally is going to be under discussion. Whether we will add an additional amount to it to increase it, um, I, I think that, that the odds would be less than 50% in my mind just because um, there's a need to, you know, kind of tighten our belts on the budget a little bit at this point in time, and that would be an additional tax credit that would mainly be utilized by um, people who already have a PV system and who um, – you know, are comfortable enough financially to look at then installing a battery array in addition to that. So it's not exactly a measure that would be directed at, like, lower and middle income individuals and helping them participate in this clean energy transition. And I think that our focus on, on you know, we have tried to have increased focus um, in recent years in bringing equity discussion into, into um, all these considerations. So and, and does, that mean so, that, does that mean that you'd rather see... Uh, batteries and, uh, you know, improvement of the system on the system level, on the utility level of the grid, or on maybe a... Yeah, I'd rather see, I'd rather see us develop programs that incentivize these batteries because we have, you know, viable programs for time of use and programs for demand response and, um, you know, a more flexible grid that's going to... Um, interact with these systems and, you know, we'll have better use of all this distributed generation when we get there. Um, so I, I think what's happening right now is all the new systems going in, almost all the new systems going in do incorporate some amount of storage yes, already. Right. And yes. the, same is, the same is true of utility-scale projects that are coming online is that all the new contracts include the storage piece. And so the tax credit that people are currently claiming at the state level is applying to that whole system, and so it's including the coverage for storage. So to do an additional tax credit um, would be increasing the tax credit, which is already like our largest tax credit mm -hmm. in the state mm -hmm. um, and has already been under a lot of scrutiny over, you know, what, what should be the discussion about ramping it down or adding in a sunset date. Um, and so I just, th I just think, in my view, the idea of that, that increasing it when most of the conversation has been about decreasing it yeah. seems like a challenge. Like we're just trying to make the case for 
to me why it's important to maintain the tax credit for, at the individual level because I think we do need to continue to build out our rooftop solar and distributed generation resources. Um, yeah. The interesting thing is at the utility scale level because renewable energy is now more than cost competitive um, with like any fossil fuel, any new fossil fuel that um, that they actually may probably don't need to continue that tax credit going forward. And like while it does, it's kind of just a pass through for them, like the actual companies who are proposing these projects. It doesn't matter to them whether they have the tax credit or not. They just want to know for sure if they have it or not so that it's not a moving target. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that could be a place where we could consider, um, you know, making changes. Yeah. Well, to, to hear you discuss these things, it really it strikes me as the, the whole conversation is so much more sophisticated than it was just only a few years ago. We've come such a long way in terms of drilling down on policy points and uh, looking into the future. It's, it's really nice to hear, you know, this, this kind of conversation. Anyway, Nicole, can we move to environment just for a minute? We only have a couple minutes left. Sure. Uh, but yeah. I want to open that by saying that environment and energy are linked at the hip. Um, and the other point I want to make and see what you think about it is that right now in this administration, this administration in Washington is not doing a whole lot about environment. In fact, they're pulling the wings out of the EPA. Uh, and I guess that means that some of the burden that the federal government might undertake these days uh, has to fall on the states. Do you agree with that? And if so, uh, what, what is happening about it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, we've seen... Um, We've had multiple bills where part of it is kind of preserving existing standards, whether it's about environmental protection and regulation. You know, the appliance efficiency bill that we passed last year um, preserved federal standards in, you know, in case they were to be repealed or rolled back, um, while also establishing new state-level standards. Um, you know, we have a bill this year that's looking at um, phasing out, regulating and phasing out and like regulating disposal of hydrofluorocarbons, which are a really potent greenhouse gas that's used in refri as for refrigerants, as a refrigerant. And so that's another thing where um, I think the federal government had been talking about doing something and then um, with the current administration, that's not moving forward. Um, and then there's really no discussion around pesticides. Um, there, there was a pyrophos issue that I think the EPA was ready to ban and then decided against that after the administration changed. Um, yeah, it goes all the way from things like that down to just discussing, you know, what, what chemicals can be allowed to be used in sunscreens, for example. Well, Nicole, I, we're out of time, but I want to say it just sounds like a great job to have. Maybe one of the most important jobs in the legislature to focus on this and these particular subjects and issues. And it strikes me that uh, I, could, I could see how one could become very passionate or possibly the other way around. A person who is passionate about these issues would really, uh, you know, enjoy participating in, in the changes that are, that are underway. Thank you so much. I hope we can do this again, Nicole. Uh, sure, yes. Thank you for asking me. And I would just mention before I go that, you know, there are a lot of other topics we're considering, climate adaptation measures, waste management, festivals, et cetera, that we didn't get to um, today, but hopefully we'll have a chance to do that in the future. Yes, let's do that. There's so much more. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back uh, in a few weeks and, uh, and, and see what else is cooking and how it's doing. Thank you so much, right. Nicole Lowen, a state representative, chair of the Energy and Environment Committee. Thank you so much.